Good afternoon. How's everyone doing? Surviving? Energy waning? That's why they give you the last spot. They were like, we'll put you on last, they'll all be so tired, they won't hear anything that you say. It'll be completely fine, completely fine. So my name is uh, Dr. Jeff Preston, and I am an assistant professor over at uh, King's University College, just across the street. Uh, for those of you who do not know King's, uh, basically we're like Western, but smaller and better, uh, essentially. Um, I was told that when you're doing a speech like this, the first thing you should do is get on stage and then insult the people in the crowd. Um, so I think we're off to a really good start. Um, I'd like to share a little bit about uh, some of my research uh, that I'm doing. Uh, research into something that is unfortunately extremely serious and something that I feel, or I fear, rather, we are not talking about enough. That problem, of course, is that there is a sickness in our community. There is an illness, a devastating malady that is affecting thousands of people, a disease that we actually don't have a cure for. It's affecting our fathers, our mothers, our children, our grandparents. Some estimates say that there may be as many as 300,000 people suffering from this disease right now. It is an illness that is viral in nature, traditionally passed from person to person, but some individuals are born with this illness. In fact, some of you right now in this room are likely carriers of this illness. Look to your right, look to your left. One of you may be infected. So be careful about who you talk to here today. It's a devastating disease that affects, unfortunately, people of all ages. It's affecting our children. Um, this is an example of a patient, uh, little Mary Lennox here. She was born with this illness, and there's unfortunately very little hope for children like her. Only the institution can provide her the care that she needs to keep her safe, and maybe more importantly, to keep us safe from her. This is an illness that's affecting our teens. In fact, many people catch this illness in their teenage years, comes on in puberty. And our example here, our patient, young Derek Wildstar, he was diagnosed entering into puberty. Luckily, with some extreme therapy, his diagnosis has gotten better. He's in remission after two years of treatment, and although his life is incalculably harder as a result of the diagnosis, uh, we have hope for him. But our story is unfortunately not always that of Derek Wildstar. Some people with this illness lose their life. This was a good friend of mine, Daniel. We lost him about a year ago to this torturous disease. And it's people like Daniel that I do my work for, because I am not going to lose another friend to this disease. I refuse to lose another mother or father or child to this awful, awful syndrome. Of course, I am talking about the disease called normalcy. Normalcy is this belief system that there is a normal kind of person. This is a disease that lurks in our mind. This idea that all people are more or less the same. It is a virus that is so potent that it has spread its ideas into everything that we do, into the ways we design our environments, the ways that we design our systems, into the ways we design our economy. We live in a world that was built for the normal, people of average heights, of average size, people with average eyes and average ears, average arms, average legs, average minds. We've designed our world on a virus, on the demands of the virus. So how do you know if you have normalcy? One of the most insidious parts of this disease is that those who have normalcy often don't know that they are affected. In fact, many of you right now who are probably carrying this awful sickness don't know. But knowing is half the battle. 
insight, as we call it, in the industry. And I hope that by maybe talking a little bit about the symptoms of normalcy, that maybe you will be able to uncover the ways in which this disease is ruining your life. The first symptom of normalcy is what I'm going to call the average fallacy. This is that belief that we have a type of human that everyone is. We have this idea that you are average in some way, that you're just like everyone else. For example, maybe if I were to ask you, how do you walk? You would respond, I don't know, like everyone else. This could be a sign of normalcy. Normates often believe that their abilities are kind of the same as everyone else, that maybe they're a little bit better, maybe they're a little bit worse off, but that more or less they kind of live in this average. This is a fallacy, but it is maybe not the worst part of normalcy. Normal supremacy is perhaps a harder issue for us to deal with. The normate, unfortunately, often believes that not only are most people normal, but that normal is the preferred state, that normalcy is something to be achieved, something to be maintained. Normates work incredibly hard to remain normal. They put themselves through these unbelievable trials. They deprive themselves of food. They force themselves through these routines of daily rigorous trials on stationary machines just to keep themselves appearing normal. It's actually very interesting. Uh, in my research, I came to Western, uh, and there's actually a facility that's been created for the normates. Uh, it's just up the hill here. Um, it is called the Campus Recreation Center. <laughs> and it's a place where normates go ritually. It's almost like a church. Um, and they wear these very small clothing that's very tight because they want to provide ocular verification of their normalcy to everyone else that's there. Um, it is fascinating. Uh, normates have such creativity in them, despite the fact that they're suffering so much. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard. Another symptom of normalcy is this unbelievable fear of loss. And I think that's maybe why people go to the recreation center in order to recreate this normalcy. It's because the normate is terrified that if they lose their normalcy, that everything will be lost. They're terrified to believe that if they were to let go of their normalcy, that this would be a bad thing. In fact, encounters with not having a normalcy is so terrifying that the normates have this annual celebration. It's an awards show where essentially they give out awards to the normates who are best able to pretend to not be normal on screen and television. It's, I guess, kind of inspiring to see them trying to be something that they're not. And maybe that's an okay thing. Maybe we should reward them. But I believe, no, why should we do that? Why shouldn't we cure them instead? It's not all fun and games. Because for the normate, it is not just about a fear of loss, but rather it is a fear that normalcy is central to their identity. That if they are no longer normal, they will no longer be themselves. This is perhaps one of the biggest delusions of the normate. This idea that the way their body functions is central to who they are. I was in clinic one day and one of my patients, uh, an older woman, a normate, uh, said to me, she said, Jeff, if I was like you in a wheelchair, I would prefer to die. Now, you can't blame her. It's the sickness talking. We're working on it. We will get better. And this is actually what brings me to what I'm most excited to talk about, um, which is my home um, on the screen here. Uh, this is the Normal Institute. Uh, you may not have seen this facility in London. It is a little hard to find. Um, but it is a massive building that we have constructed with donations from people that are concerned about the normals around them, hoping to get them help through rigorous therapy, through treatments, 
We're experimenting with stem cell, with medication, with CBT. We're hoping that we will be able to end normalcy in our lifetime. We're hopeful. But to do that, we, of course, need many donations and supporters. So, of course, if you would like to help us in our fight against normalcy, uh, you'd like to help and volunteer maybe at the Institute, uh, we can talk after the presentation. It, there's nothing more inspiring. You will find yourself by working with these sick people and helping them to get better. Uh, it, it truly is a heartwarming, uh, heartwarming thing. And you know, you can put it on your Tinder uh, profile afterwards as well, because it shows that you're a really caring person. Uh, you're, looking after, you're looking after the sick. So people often ask me, Jeff, how do we make sure that we don't get normalcy? If I don't have it yet, what can I do to ensure that I do not become one of these people that suffers from the concept of normalcy? And I think that it is about looking inward. I think that the cure to normalcy is about looking at the ways in which our minds obfuscate the truth of our reality. I think it is about looking into our minds about the ways in which we try to be something that maybe we aren't. The ways in which we fear, absolutely terrified, about not living up to the standard of normalcy. I think that we need to embrace the ways in which we are fundamentally fragile, vulnerable people. Because I think when we look internally, when we look inside and we say, I am not normal, I do not do things the ways that other people do them, it forces us to then to start to think differently about the world, think differently about the ways in which we structure it. Because if you're not normal, if I'm not normal, if no one in this room is normal, then why do we continue to build a world for the normal? Now, of course, many people look at disability and they see loss, they see sickness, they see suffering, they see struggle. But I think that the normate can actually learn some important things about disability. I think that where disability often stands as a memorial for that which can be lost as a testament about the fragility of our lives. Instead, disability could be rather proof that we can survive, proof that we are more than our corporeal selves, that instances and moments of loss are actually not necessarily something to be frowned upon, something to be dwelled on, something to lament. Maybe it is something to be celebrated. Maybe it is an opportunity to innovate. Maybe it's an opportunity to think about ourselves and our world differently. Perhaps to fix normalcy, we need to look at the ways in which our differences define us, create us, and the ways in which normalcy obfuscates us, divides us, separates us. So I hope today and tomorrow, and over the next few weeks, that you will start to dream about a world without normalcy. That you'll start to let yourself let go of the normalcy, to let go of the sickness in your mind. Because frankly, if you do that, you will have one less thing to worry about. Thank you. <laughs>